Okay. So thank you for joining us tonight um, for our mini Comic-Con program, Breaking Into Comics. Um, we are really pleased to have two guests with us tonight, and I will introduce both of them. And then we're going to go through a series of questions and things that we think are really um, kind of interesting and relevant to this topic, and then we would love to take questions from you as well. So um, our first guest I'm going to introduce is Jean Ha. Um, Jean is a New York Times best-selling comic book artist. Uh, he writes and draws May, volumes one and two. Uh, he is known for his work with writer Alan Moore on Top Ten and its prequel, The 49ers. He has won four Eisners, which is the highest award in American comics, and an Inkapot Award, and he lives in our area in Chicago. We also have with us Christina Steen Stewart uh, with us tonight. Um, she goes by Steen, so let's all refer to her tonight. Um, she is a cartoonist, editor, and professor. She is the co creator of the archival quality graphic novel, which is a winner of the Dwayne McDuffie Award for Diversity in Comics. She is currently authoring and illustrating the daily syndicated comic strip Heart of the City, um, which makes her one of the few African American women to write a syndicated comic. Um, she also currently teaches cartooning at Webster University, and she is based in St. Louis. Um, one of the nice things about kind of doing programs in this area is that we're able to work with people who are not just in Chicagoland, and, but kind of bring people to you that are from all over the country, and that um, is something we would never have would have been able to do in the library. So we're very exciting for us to be able to have students with us tonight. So. Um, before we get into our questions, I was just, let's just start with Jean. And I know I gave a few oh. of like the highlights of your career, but maybe you can tell us maybe a little bit more and maybe one of the things you're proudest of. And then you might want to share, um, if you want to, a few things on the screen to show the audience some maybe examples of your work. Oh man, you know, um, I'll mention that I'm really proud of having worked, I mentioned in my bio, I mentioned that I've worked with Alan Moore. I'm very proud of my work with him. But uh, I have a port little portfolio I have with me, but I forgot to include a piece from Top 10. But if you want to, just Google Gene Ha, Top 10, Alan Moore, any of those things, and you'll see images from it. But let me show you some other stuff real quick. Um, and while I am calling this up, I'm also going to say uh, there's a story that, uh, or a, a kind of a description of breaking into comics that um, writer Mark Wade has, which is that every time comics is like a secret base. With, uh, with lots of guards. And every time someone figures out how to get into comics, the guards come along and then fill in the hole so no one else can break in in exactly that same way again. Um, it's not completely true, but it's kind of true. So you can't break in exactly the way someone else broke in five years ago. Um, and you especially can't break in the way I did um, in 1992, when you could actually just mail photocopies to Marvel and DC Comics, and they would send you a letter back automatically either saying, we're hiring you, or like this one that you're seeing on the screen right now, saying, we are not hiring you. Here's all the things you did wrong. And um, they checked all of them off, except for one, which they probably should have checked off too. I was uh, just out of art school and this was really hard to take. But then um, after I did that, I had a backup plan, which is I also sent samples to DC, who also contacted me to say they don't want to hire me. But they did, the editor, Neil Posner did write, but I like your stuff. Can I send you more scripts and you can, you'll can you send me more samples? And being mentored by him uh, was what really got me into comics. And that will very rarely happen, just like Mark Wade's description of a secret base. Uh, this is, the next thing you'll see is a short story I'm most um, proud of, which is um, a Batman story with writer and editor Archie Goodwin um set in Arkham Asylum and I started off doing work inside of a black and white ink style this is before uh everyone had computer scanners and iPads and all that type of stuff so this is just ink on some really stiff paper but um working in really super highly cross-hatched uh dollar bill type styles was destroying my eyes my hands so I began moving on to different styles and the next image you'll see is uh a good sample of what my um, current style kind of looks like when I'm doing superheroes, which is bright colors, crisp lines, and not so much cross hatching. I've gotten a chance to work on other characters like uh, different versions of Superman. This is the Superman of Earth 23, who is also the president of that world. And a lot of librarians know this image, which is a read poster with um, the most famous librarian inside of comics, Batgirl. Uh, I'm currently working on the series May, uh, volume one and two are out, which is about two sisters from Indiana 
who um, one of whom disappeared when she was a teenager at the age of 13. And when she comes back uh, at the age of 21, when her younger sister is 18, she says she's been in another world full of monsters and mad scientists, which her sister has trouble believing up until some of the monsters start following her back. And uh, I'm also doing some other projects which are unannounced now, so I can't talk about that right yet, but um, I'm having a lot of fun in comics and I've watched a lot of amazingly ta talented people break in in many, many different ways. Uh, so I will hand that off now to one of, well, who, the person who is literally the most multi-talented person <laughs> I've met in comics, Steen. Yeah. So I, you know, I, it's hard to say, you know, use the word break into comics because I feel like I slid into comics <laughs> just like slowly over time. I just ended up there. <laughs> um, it definitely started with, I started um, uh, working at the comic book store Star Clipper in St. Louis. And while I was there, that's when I, um, that's when I was reading books that's when I was reading comics that's when I was really trying to like jump into um everything comics I had always grown up reading comics and watching tv you know animated movies and animated tv shows but I never actually read any like single issue comics um that just wasn't really something that I grew up with um and then after working at the comic book store is when I started to really get an idea of what it is I wanted to do with my art you know I went to school for art um, I liked comics I liked cartoons but I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it and I find that oftentimes art schools will give you all the things that you need in order to be a better uh, creator in terms of craft but not so much when it comes to um, making a living <laughs> off of it you know there's not really a class on how to break into one kind of industry or one kind of job up within the industry and I realized that pretty quickly um, so I dropped out of school um, it was also really expensive to go to school so I was just like this isn't working for me <laughs> so I ended up working at the comic book store and after that you know I saw other people making comics and it wasn't until I saw uh, Brittany Williams comic um, on she did Samurai Jack uh, she was the artist on that where I was like, I could make comics. I could do that. Like that, something I can do. Like I, I literally sell comics. I read comics. I, I eat and breathe comics. Why wouldn't I think to draw them as well? So um, once I saw someone else that looked like me doing it, that's when it clicked. Like, okay, maybe this is something that I can do. Um, but I didn't really know exactly where, because you know, like there's there's no guidebook on it. Um, but I did know that my local. Uh, drawing group called Ink and Drink Comics. They were making uh, anthology series every season based on a different genre of comics. And uh, anyone could join. All you have to do is draw or write or both. And so I was like, well, I can draw if you pair me with a that I did. And it was actually like really, really fun because I learned how to work with editors. I learned how to work collaboratively. Um, you know, I learned a lot of different stuff um, from doing that. So um, after I did that comic in the anthology, that's when I was like, okay, I wanna do more of these. So I was doing mini comics. I was drawing, you know, fan art. You know, so many people say, oh, you can't do fan art because that's not gonna get you anywhere. Well, in this industry, it will. <laughs> so definitely keep drawing fan art. Um, but let me show you uh, the works that I have. Ba -ba -ba. Share the screen. Okay, let me know when you can see the screen and I'll keep it going. Yep, we can, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, so I was doing fan art. I was doing all sorts of little doodles because, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do yet. And um, so, you know, I did a lot of fan art and I did a lot of portraiture. I just, I did what I liked and I did what I knew. And from that, you know, I was invited to do some comics as well. And some of the comics that I do um, I don't really put um, 
some of them I, I don't even like make them incredibly like pristine like this middle one here I just wanted to put comics out there and I think that's the most important thing that you should learn if you want to break into comics now it's that you have to make comics to get into comics you know because as an editor I want to find somebody who knows what they're doing you know I want to find somebody who's actually made comics before even if it was just little you know dumb ones like this middle one here um but after I got into those anthologies, I ended up getting a book deal with Oni Press. We submitted to their open submissions back in 2015, 2016. And uh, me and my friend Ivy, we were like, okay, we have this story. We know we want to go with it. Um, we want to put it online, but they're doing open submissions. So what's the worst that could happen? You know, if we don't get in, we'll just put it up online like we had it planned on, you know? And we ended up getting picked and it all became very real, very fast <laughs> because then we had to uh, write a book. So um, after that, Archival Quality came out um, that won the Dwayne McDuffie Award. And I had done a couple of other anthology pieces, which won Ignatz Awards and Eisner's. And so that's really where my career kind of jump started was after Archival Quality. Um, but I was doing, you know, comics still on my own, like those small ones that I just showed you. Um, and I also wanted to do like Encyclopedia Brown comics as well. Um, so all those comics that I was doing on my own is what got the editor for Heart of the City to find my work. And she thought that my work would be really good to replace the uh, author who was doing Art of the City before me, Mark Tatuli. He was doing it for 21 years. And after doing a daily comic for 21 years, yeah, it's time to take a break. <laughs> so um, that's when they reached out to me to see if I would do um, part of the city. And so I said yes, and I auditioned for the part. And I created all these new characters and new styles. And I've been doing it for the past six months, five months, I don't know, since April. Uh, so it's been really, really fun. And it's really wild to be doing a daily comic. But after archival quality, um, and I stopped working at the library, I was working at Lion Forge. And I was an editor there, but before that I was doing social media. So I was also doing marketing and sales. But then I moved over to editorial and after moving over to editorial, that's when I was like, oh, I love this. Like, this is so much fun. And so I actually um, edited Rolled and Told, which was the gaming magazine. Um, I helped edit Witchy, which is the uh, Ignat award winning webcomic that has been published now. Um, Incredible, which was superheroes. And then I've also done stuff after I left Lion Forge as well. So Work for a Million was one that just came out and it was the first lesbian gumshoe novel and it was being adapted into a graphic novel. And so I helped edit that. I worked with Tapas, I worked with individuals. World's Strongest, that's actually a piece that I helped um, Juan put his pitch together and it ended up getting picked up by Action Lab. So that was really cool. So yeah, that's, that's what I do. I do editorial, I do comics, I teach at Webster, I do a little bit of everything. Um, it's probably because I can't say no to things. <laughs> wow, okay, so there's so many things to talk about here. So um, let me just ask you kind of both a general question in terms of like, um, in your opinion, what makes, like, what do you, like, what makes a comic book or a comic strip great? Like what, what makes you look at something or read something and it really like excites you? For me, I think it's the relatability. Um, relatability and re-readability of it. Um, that's like when, you know, when people say like, you know, what's your favorite horror movie? And it's like, well, I always choose the ones that I can rewatch over and over again because I, I love it so much. And I, I feel the same way about books as well. I, those are the ones that I either want to read all over again or I want to give to someone else and say, you have to read this. Um, but the relatability part of it, I usually like comics where like, I can, I feel like I can see myself and it doesn't even have to be like a literal see myself. I just want to see like a, a certain type of relationships or certain types of relationships with their parents or a slice of life, or if it's a superhero book, what makes it different from other superhero books. And I, I think making sure that it's something that speaks to the readership of today is something that I think is really uh, 
really great for comics. Gene, how about you? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go for something. I'm going to kind of specify why comics is different than a lot of other visual storytelling mediums and what I really love in a great comic book. Um, when you go for other visual mediums, it tends to be team efforts like uh, movies, animation, things like that. It tends to be often hundreds or thousands of people working on a single project. And a good comic project usually has um, two main creatives on it or one creative even, uh, often doing everything except maybe the lettering or some of the graphic design, a few elements like that. And a really great comic book will usually have a strong authorial voice. You can really feel an individual personality behind it and a quirkiness to it, which doesn't always feel super polished, but it makes you feel like the creator or the creators of the book are your friend. Like, you know them, they're speaking just to you. And it, there's almost like a love note feel to it of, um, it, it feels more like it was made just for you than anything, almost anything else. It's very personal. So since these projects are kind of often like one person shows, maybe two people, you're responsible for a lot of different things. You could be the, the lettering, the coloring, the writing. There's so many different components. So um, what is your favorite part of the process and what is your least favorite part of the process? Mm. So I have really only ever done comics where I penciled, inked, and colored it myself. Like I've never sent my inks off to a colorist. So um, this is with the idea that I'm doing it. Um, I actually really enjoy the inking stage the most because I feel like with pencils, you're kind of like, well, here's the idea of it. Uh, you know, this is how it's going to look, I think, maybe. And then inks, it's like, okay, it's, it's done done. This is how it's gonna be. And so you get to have a lot of, um, a lot of control over what the finished product really looks like when you're in the inking stage. Um, and it's different when you're inking digitally than when you're inking traditionally, because when you're inking traditionally, it's like, there's no going back, <laughs> you know, either you kind of go head for head first into this or you're gonna have to deal with white out <laughs> which like sucks <laughs> um but like now because it's all digital it's it, it, nothing really has that permanence anymore unless you forget to save <laughs> so you know i i think inking is still it's still I, I don't know i still feel like it has that permanence even though i can very easily hit you know command z <laughs> um yeah. least part though is lettering I hate lettering. It's because I'm not good at it. And there are people who do it for a living and they should be doing it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I like that answer. I mean, it, I'm very different. So uh, for scenes, it's the moment when the comic becomes real. So inking is when it becomes real. For me, my favorite part is uh, the pencil rough stage when I'm designing the page and figuring out the storytelling and uh, whether I'm writing my own dialogue and story or I'm working from somebody else's script, uh, that thing where I figure out how every story beat works, how it all interacts, uh, little pauses and actor moments and stuff like that. It, it feels like live theater when I'm coming up with the ideas. And then afterwards, when I'm doing the inking for me personally, it feels like making a movie out of a live theater experience and everything is a much harder slog. Mm. But that fresh moment where I feel like, yeah, everything's possible and it's just happening at the moment that's what i love the rough the rough stage that's so fascinating oh uh, least favorite stage yeah least favorite stage same as teens i am the worst not the worst letter of the world <laughs> but i'm not a good one and i respect professionals so much you do it well yeah seriously lettering is another it's another world but yeah. i think it's so interesting the way that you describe you know the roughs in the pencil stage because it's true like that's the kind of feeling that a lot of people get you know i work with a lot of different writers and i work with a lot of different creators and that part that stage of the process is honestly the most exciting for a lot of the team members i think for me i see it as like it's just a part of the job you know, like if you want to finish a comic, the comic needs to be finished, <laughs> you know, like my, my yeah. goal isn't to like, yeah. I don't know, it's like, um, I liken it to penciling and, and, and roughing is like taking a shower and brushing your teeth. It's just something you have to do. And then inking and coloring is like putting on makeup. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, for me, it's, for me, it's like doing a big quick doodle of, 
taking a big crayon and a piece of construction paper and drawing your dream car. That's the rough stage. It was like, <laughs> all my dreams can be true. And here's everything I want it to be. And then the inking stage is building the car and going to yeah. the auto supply store and buying the parts. And it's kind of like, oh, no, having a wheel on top of the roof doesn't work as well as I thought it did. But it looks so cool in the drawing, but I'll make it work. Yeah, that's wild. I love it. <laughs> so um, I'm wondering what um, both of you think about just some general trends that you see in the comic industry, whether it's about, you know, artistic style, you know, the publishing part of it, maybe it's the diversity that you see in the comics industry, like just some general trends that you see, take, you know, kind of gaining steam. Hmm. I mean, right now I see a lot of, you know, own voices stories, which is great. That's exactly what we need to have. Yes. Um, I also am seeing a lot of colleges taking comics seriously in that they are hiring oh, yeah. people to be mentors, which is incredible. I'm a mentor for the first time this year. And, um, you know, it's, I'm getting, getting paid to like help this student finish their project from, you know, for a full year of school. And that's just like a really awesome opportunity that a lot of people would not have normally had back when I was in school. And I was only in school back in like, when did I start college? Like 2007, 2008. And it's like, that sort of thing wasn't a thing, you know? Um, so I really love that people are really finding comics as a, a legitimate uh, art form and something that you can actually do um, for a living. Yeah. Um, hmm. I'm going to say like the one of the biggest trends and this is kind of amplifying a bit of what Steens was talking about is that nowadays the way to go is definitely to be the author, be the creator, or be the owner of the property you're making. Uh, and working on licensed books is getting to be less and less rewarding over time. Uh, you're competing with everyone in the world, literally, who can get an internet connection, send in art. Uh, back when I started, it was your only dealing with other Americans mostly. Um, and just getting more and more competitive every year. Page rates for doing license work is going down. There's less, less creative control as more corporations. Can, well, I mean, Disney owns Marvel. And Disney takes a lot more control over the final product and the whole comics line than having no one over Marvel at all back in the 1990s. Um, Time Warner own, owns uh, DC, things like that. So doing the license books is getting is less fun than it used to be. I mean, I still enjoy it. I still enjoy it. When I get the chance to draw Superman or something, it's still great fun. But it used to be a lot wilder and used to be able to do a lot crazier stuff when I was young. And if you went to the generation before me, it got really nuts. Um, so, but then fortunately also the rise of uh, creator owned books uh, and just the way that they're now completely dominating the market is really, really wonderful. And then all the different venues for doing it, um, different forms of web comics, uh, actually having a strange South Korean company line webtoon so as a corporation finding out a way to support creator owned books and stuff like that all the different voices uh, Steens talks about that are just distinctive and have new points of view it's really exciting and it's very very different than when I came up in comics so what would you tell someone um, who is an aspiring um, like someone who wants to write for comics they're just getting going I guess what advice would you give them and I know you both have had some experiences in like both formal like art education and then kind of informal art education so just kind of curious about your thoughts about those topics how someone should get started I mean I think everyone should definitely start by working on their craft um, and by working on your craft that could mean going to an art school that could mean um, you know, working at Victoria's Secret and drawing on the weekends like I did, you know, it doesn't really matter where you get that practice as long as you get that practice in because it's very, very vital. You know, some people say like, oh man, I wish I could draw. And it's like, well, you can, you just have to put in the time and the effort, which is exactly what all of us are doing. We're doing it because we love it. But if you think about like how many hours we've spent of our lives drawing, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot, it's a whole lot. And you have to consider it as, if, I don't know, I feel like you, you really need to consider it as like a career. If you wanna get into it and if you want this to be your job, take it as seriously as you want it to be, you know? Um, so definitely work on the craft first. You have to know the basics. You gotta know how to draw people, 
animals, layouts, um, understand storytelling, understand visual literacy, understand color, understand a lot of different things. And a lot of that stuff you can get from going to school or from just doing them, from just creating them yourself, getting feedback from others. Um, you can get it from uh, doing anthologies. I learned pretty much everything I know about print specs from doing anthologies, you know? So there's a lot of different ways that you can get that knowledge. But then once you have that knowledge, now you need to figure out, okay, what do I need to do with it? How do I get people to see it? So back in 2010s, you know, the last decade, I would suggest, you know, going on and getting a Twitter, get an Instagram, you know, really make sure that there's a place for people to see your art and see your work. But now I'm not exactly sure what to tell people um, just because I feel like I'm too far away from it now. I'm at a point where like I don't really have to put my work out there as often or as aggressively, you know? I mean, I have my website and I have an agent and I put my work out there, but I'm not doing it in a way where it's like, I gotta get people to know who I am because I've already passed that point. And so, and I know things are just so different now than they were even 10 years ago, you know? So um, in terms of getting people to see your work, I still kind of say social media because as an editor, that's where I find people. I find people on Twitter and Instagram and all sorts of places. Um, but I think maybe being a part of a discord would be helpful because then you'll be with a community that can help you move forward. And I think that having a strong community is definitely one of the best assets you can have. Um, but also it's a great way to learn about resources and opportunities and you know, just finding the right discords and finding the right communities to be a part of will help as well. Yeah, um, I'm going to kind of emphasize uh, folks in on one thing Steve was talking about, which is the whole finding your community type thing. Uh, old story, uh, I'm friends with uh, legendary art dealer and editor Scott Dunbeer. And way back when, uh, this very popular artist named Mike Mignola, who's a friend of his, uh, had been doing superhero work. And at one point, he began, he faxed over some images, this is a long time ago, uh, faxed over some images to Scott saying, what do you think of this stuff? Do you think it's any good? But he really simplified his style. And Scott said, this is effing fantastic. This is great. And it's like, I don't know if this Hellboy thing is going to catch on. I, I'm not cross-hatching or rendering it as much. It's so simple. No, this is great, Mike. Mike, you need to put this out in the world. <laughs> I hate it. I kind of hate it now. And Mike, uh, Scott talked Mike into putting out Hellboy. Uh, I probably would have done it anyway, but he definitely needed a cheerleader to tell him, yep. this is not a fool's errand. I see what you're doing and it's brilliant. And if you can find that community of people who can talk to you honestly, understand what you're trying to do and will tell you when you're doing it right and when you're getting off course from the goal that they understand and that you understand, because sometimes you, you just lack confidence. You think, no, I need to make it look like everybody else's work. Um, there's, another old, there's an old saying uh, just in the general arts, which is that, Every artist needs a friend standing behind them with a hammer. And as soon as the painting is finished, the friend takes the mallet and knocks them on the head so they stop overworking the painting. Mm -hmm. And yeah, sometimes you just need somebody to tell you, yeah, you succeeded. Stop trying to fix what's actually perfect now. And you just need a community of people who understand what you're doing and give you feedback because you'll go crazy if you're just on your own trying to figure out if it's good enough. And you'll Absolutely. never feel like it's good enough. That's true. I mean, that kind of ties into, you know, when people say, uh, like, how do you know when to start? Start when you have an idea, because if you wait until you think you're ready for it, you're never going to be ready for it. I mean, even yeah. I'm a syndicated cartoonist, <laughs> I'm making my living off of co comics. And even I am like, eh, I could do this better, you know, so it's like, if I just waited until I was better, it wouldn't have happened. So do it when you when you can. And then also be vocal about what you want too. Because like if that story with Mike Nola happened where he decided he wasn't gonna say anything to his friends, he wasn't gonna show off his Hellboy work, he'd have this stuff just on his own together, you know, just him. And so like he, I think it's really important for people to actually be vocal about what it is that they want to do and put it out in the world because you never know who's listening. You know, I was, a uh, on a panel where I was talking about how horrifying the house buying process was for me. Um, it was probably the worst thing I've ever had to go through in my life. And um, I hated every second of it. But one of the things that I hated out of it was how much information I didn't have. 
And so I was talking on a panel about how I'm working on, slowly, a mini comic about how to buy a house. And so it's mm-hmm. like it's super simple, but you can't find it anywhere. How to buy a house, how to especially do it if you're a freelancer, you know, and to show that this isn't something that you have to wait until you're like 40 years old to go and buy a house, you know? And I did not know who was at that panel. And someone emailed me saying, I watched your panel. I work for, you know, this publisher. What do you think about doing a book of all things that have to be debunked as, you know, too hard or quote unquote adulting, you know, (laughs) make it clear that these are things that anyone can do. And I was like, that's awesome. I still haven't finished that comic, (laughs) but when it's finished, let's talk, you know? And so if I didn't tell anyone that that's something that I wanted to do, where would I have ever gotten that opportunity to get it published? You know, who knows? Steens, but we were talking earlier, we were talking a little bit about um, people who are really fascinated with comics, but don't necessarily have great illustrating skills. Oh, yeah. So um, what if someone's just really fascinated with the world of comics, but they, you know, they're not particularly, like, their, their illustrating skills aren't quite there. How else can they be a part of this world? So there's a lot of people in the comics industry that aren't illustrators, you know, so you can be a part of the comics industry and not a comic writer or a comic illustrator. Um, How are comics put together? They're assembled. Assembled by whom? An assembler. So you can assemble comics. Um, What about like we were talking about lettering? Those are people with the lettering job and they are great at it. They're not drawing comics. Um, Editors. I edit comics. you don't have to know how to draw to be an editor. You just have to know how to, to, to pick up on what is an effective story and what's not an effective story. Um, how do you sell the book? You gotta have a sales team. You gotta have marketing. You gotta have um, someone who will fund it. You gotta have someone who um, knows about Kickstarter. So there's a lot of moving pieces to the world of comics that anyone can really be a part of it. You just kind of have to know, well, where do you feel best at? You know, What do you think you've done in your past that can help you with something in your future. You know, I put together a a program called Comics University at my library where every year we talk about all sorts of things with comics. And I've been doing that program for eight years. That is not just event planning, but that also falls under coordinating with volunteers. That also falls under education. And it was because of that job in education that I ended up getting a teaching job for cartooning. So it's like every little thing that you do can lead you to comics. You just kind of have to like think outside the box. What can comics get from me? You know, what can I offer to the industry and then offer it? Great. Yeah. Um, Oh, that's a fabulous answer. Can I just throw, I'm gonna throw in two quick things. Um, We're also in this very weird age where um, online class, as kids everywhere are now are suffering through, online classes are getting better and better, even if they're not as much fun as actually hanging out with your friends in in a classroom. Um, But yeah, there are fabulous classes you can take now that are as good as the art class I took in college in many ways. Uh, Where like um, about seven years ago, I met this kid named, you can find him online, by the way, named Ethan Castillo. It looks like Castillo. he was eight years old and he showed me his little portfolio of Spider-Man drawings, which were unusually good for an eight-year-old. Um, and if you go to his Instagram now, he is a world famous 16-year-old, I believe, Spider-Man artist with a really, really popular Instagram. And he is learning digital painting at a level where a lot of college graduates aren't at that level yet. Um, and he has a lot of people, he has like five times as many people following on Instagram as I do, because he's gotten really good. And um, you can learn a lot of these skills. You can learn writing and stuff like that. You can find communities, obviously, like the fanfic communities to learn writing skills and stuff like that. There are ways to learn all these skills if you really want to focus in on one. But I'm, I'm also going to mention of all the skills that uh, Steen's mentioned, the one that is always uh, short in any of the arts, there's always a shortage of these in the arts, are good ethical people with excellent business skills. Mm-hmm. Uh, and having people who are both good and good at business is kind of a shortage. So if you're the good person who can make, make finance work and you join a team of people working making a comic book, you are the one who's going to make the dream come true because most people in art, the arts are kind of idiots with finance. So <laughs> we really need you. Excellent. So Jean, I have a question for you. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, your work on May um, because it focuses on the story of, of these sisters and monsters. And I was just wondering, 
So where does that voice come from? You decided to write about these sisters and I don't know if you have sisters or, or kind of oh, how no. you decided to come up with that voice <laughs> for your work. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, my brain is, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, when I first got into the comic book books, um, I read a graphic novel by a comics book writer and artist named Kyle Baker called uh, Why I Hate Saturn, which was about two sisters. And Kyle Baker is a man. Um, and it kind of blew me away that he wrote about these two women in a really convincing way and how they feuded and how they loved each other, but they still were fighting all the time because they're siblings. Um, and it just kind of taught me that, you know, uh, well, taught me that you need to, if you want to write, you need to expand out and learn about other people, but also that you can write about anyone you want. Uh, if you can be kind of honest about it and kind of, and also at the time when, uh, I finally got serious about going just from drawing comics to writing there weren't very many books about female main characters at that time. And in 2013, I literally had trouble finding in pop culture, any female geeks who were the main characters of an action book or something like that. They're always the person on a headset in the background saying, okay, you need to go down that hallway and then go turn right and then cut the red wire. Thanks side character. Now I'm the hero, you know? Um, and I want to do a book about um, a geek female character who was, who's the main character. And uh, I will say in a really beautiful, wonderful way now, uh, there's so many more voices now and that's not as kind of as a version of a thing, but I wanted to tell a story of characters like that. And to do that, I just, I know so many actual heroic, brave, smart, incredibly geeky women in my life because I work in comics. And I just didn't see a lot of people fictional characters leading comic books who are like them. So I just wanted to make one. That's awesome. You were able to identify that, that gap and, and fill it. So Steens, I have a question for you about um, Heart of the City. So yeah. your style is probably very different from the strip's creator. And so oh, yeah. what has it been like trying to make the strip your own while still staying true to the character's personality and the tradition that he'd had for writing this comic strip for many, many years? Yeah, so this is actually... I consider this like my first like real writing gig because <laughs> with Archival Quality, I was a co-creator, um, but I didn't really do any of the writing. Um, and kind of the same with uh, the current book that I'm working on as well, um, where I'm a co-creator, but I'm only writing, I'm writing my memoir sections and I'm writing some of it. So, you know, the Heart of the City is the first one that um, I've been able to do that feels like, okay, I have to write a story <laughs> and uh what I did is I I actually sat for like a weekend and read at least a year's worth of comics for every year that Heart of the City had been out which is a lot when they're daily comics um but I think with that is how I figured out what was really the the heart of the story you know um and I wanted to be able to get that across through um, body language, through storytelling, through dialogue, through how Hart relates to the other characters, how those other characters relate to her. Um, all of that stuff isn't really tied to a single drawing style. So it was definitely different for there to be a, a new, completely different artist, because usually if you get a new artist on a syndicated comic strip, they try and mimic the original artist's style. So you can kind of see that with like Nancy, even though it looks like Olivia James's work, it still looks very much like the original Nancy still. Um, with Heart of the City, it's not the case, you know? So I actually didn't realize that my editor was like, no, 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 you can make it all yours. You don't have to mimic any part of it. <laughs> but coming from single issue comics, um, I definitely wanted to be able to bring things from the past and use them again, like a callback, you know? So whether it was what people were wearing or what kind of stories we told or any of it, I wanted to make sure that the uh, continuity was relatively the same still, even though I had the opportunity to, to start from scratch. Um, and, and that's the 
the Wednesday warrior in me. <laughs> I was like, no, no, no. Cause remember in this issue, so-and-so happened and my editor will be like, that's really nice of you to go back to all of that, but it's not necessary. <laughs> so I think the hardest part was kind of juggling what parts can I make that are officially mine and what parts am I going to take from Tatuli's original work and how much of it to, to really make it a balance that it feels like an entirely brand new thing. So that's um, an amazing I, opportunity. That sounds that must have been super exciting for you. Yeah, it was very exciting. It was actually very scary, actually, because you know, being a black woman, I know that eyes are going to be on me a lot more than anyone else. And so the first thing that I did is I looked to see, okay, well, what other black women are doing comics like currently? And there were two. Um, one of which is one of my closest friends. <laughs> and then the other one was um, Barbara Brandon Croft, who did Where I'm Coming From. And um, I met both of them like almost immediately after I got the gig. And it was just like, I don't know, it's, it's weird because when you come from comics and there are hundreds of creators, thousands of creators, tens of thousands of comics creators out there, with syndicated comics, that's not the case. Most people in syndicated comics stay for years. Like Tatuli, he stayed for 21 years. And I think it has to do with the landscape of syndicated comics. You know, their original contracts were 15 year contracts. Imagine getting a Superman gig and they're like, okay, well, you're the Superman writer for the next 15 years. You know, like that's, that's something that you can like plan a life with, you know? And, um, because of that, because of the way that industry is, you don't get a lot of new fresh faces. And when you get new fresh faces, it's a big deal. So, you know, we are thankfully past all of the hate mail six months later. <laughs> but yeah, change is definitely not as uh, welcome in syndicated comics as they are in traditional comics. So it was an interesting thing to get used to for sure. We have a really good question from yeah, someone um, who is um, watching. I want to make sure we get to this question. Um, the person is asking, do you have to know someone in the industry in order to send something in? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm a senior. I'm in my senior year in art school, and I only just decided I'm going into comics as of this year. Wow, congratulations. Welcome to the industry. <laughs> um, you don't have to know someone in order to send anything in. I think it just depends on what you're sending in. You know, are you sending in just art? You know, what do you, what do you want out of it? You know, because if you want to create a graphic novel, you got to have a pitch. And if in order to do a pitch, you have to be able to put together a pitch packet and you have to know what goes into a pitch packet, in which case you have to find an editor. Um, if you're just wanting to do work for hire, you know, so licensed stuff, Batman, Superman, you know, the superhero stuff. Um, even then you still need to know exactly what you want from it. Do you want to write? Do you want to illustrate? Do you want to color? And then you need to look for uh, what are the best ways to get into that. Is that through submissions or is that from going to portfolio reviews or is that from going to conventions and speaking to the people that are actually there? Um, it really just depends on what area of comics you want to get into. Um, but there are options if you don't know anyone. I just suggest start looking into, you know, going on Twitter, looking for Discord groups and finding the people that are actually currently in comics because they can also give you some um, some advice for who to speak to and, and when and how and all that kind of stuff. Gene, what do you think yeah. about that? Um, I'm also going to see. Oh, um, well, I'm going to the bigger and more dominant a company is that you're trying to break into, uh, the harder it is to even get them to look at a submission. So uh, if you wanted to get a, a yeah, portfolio or a whole graphic novel or samples looked at at either Marvel, DC, or Scholastic, uh, they pretty much have a policy of, we can tell you right now, we're not interested. Please do not send us anything. Mm -hmm. But smaller publishers will be much more open to it. Uh, and then I'm going to divide up the market into um, the direct market comic shop comics market, which focuses on floppy magazine style comics. And then the, uh, the book market, graphic novel market, which usually focuses on smaller, stiffer books like this, like the most famous graphic novel of all time of this century, at least. So, um, and uh, yeah, if you want to, uh, 
if you want to do work for hire, yeah, you can you can check the submissions policies of different companies, and they'll usually have a website which specifies what you should do if you want to uh, submit. Uh, you can also try to look for an agent, though that's kind of hard. And I will say that the um, in a way the easiest the easiest this is incredibly hard the easiest way to break into comics is just to start putting it out there and uh, finding either uh, something like Line Webtoon or any type of uh, website that supports that type of stuff, even like Twitter, uh, and just putting out strips and sharing your work. Um, if you look at something like, uh, I can't remember her name, last name right now, but uh, Sarah of Sarah Scribbles. Mm, Anderson. It was just a series. Oh, Sandra Anderson, right. Yeah, it was just kind of a series of stuff she just shared on social media, just like, here's my reaction to... Uh, oh man, just uh, why I love cats and why I hate people. And it just turned into this brilliant thing that built and built and built up. And I should also mention, it started off with her drawing in a relatively rendered style. And then it became the incredibly stripped down, simplified style that we love today. And she just realized what was the essence of what she was doing. And it got better and better. And that turned into book deals. And that turned into getting flown to Italy to talk to conferences and things like that. And um, yeah, she did not, she didn't break in by waiting for someone to give her approval. Yeah, absolutely. Starting small is honestly the best advice anyone can give, you know? Um, with those small publishers that, you know, Jean was talking about, they do like talent searches, they do actual kinds of outreach to find new creators where, you know, companies like DC and Marvel, they don't really need to do that, <laughs> you know? Like anyone is, everyone is chomping at the bit to work for them, you know? So whoever they want, they can pretty much get. Now with smaller publishers, they're gonna be the ones that will work with you and you may find an editor who wants to help you develop something, you know? So definitely start small. I, I was thinking about uh, Becky Cloonan recently and Becky made her like huge, you know, uh, amount of, athletes from her mini comics that she put out herself so she self-published a lot of her comics and now she has illustrated and written for batman and i think now she is doing a new series with jen bartell for wonder woman now this is like 10 15 years later after she was doing those mini comics but comics is not a short game you know, that's not something that you can get for as like passive income, you know, it's a long game career, you know, if this is something you want, you have to work at it and you have to be consistent. You don't have to work at it every single day. You know, I hate when people say like, you got to draw every day, draw your, your sketchbook every day. Don't do that because you might get, you know, carpal tunnel, <laughs> you know, also you don't want to force yourself to draw something if you don't want to draw it, draw when you feel good about it. Um, but you definitely have to start small and things get bigger from that, I promise you. It, it doesn't feel like it, I guarantee it, but it will. Terrific. Ooh, I wanna so put a, oh, can I put in one more shout out? Yeah, um, So we're all locked down right now. We're all trying to avoid actually hanging out in person, but uh, next year, I can almost guarantee you this uh, library called the Vernon Area Public Library <laughs> is going to be holding an event like this, but it's gonna be in person. And it's going to have an artist alley. And if you go to an artist alley, an in-person artist alley, um, you can meet a lot of artists there with a lot of wisdom. And at one table, no matter how big the convention and how exciting the guest list, if you go into any artist alley, you're going to see one person who's just kind of sitting there bored saying, oh, I wish somebody would talk to me. <laughs> and if you go to that person and ask them how to break into comics, they might be really eager just to have a conversation. Um, and it might just be this 10 minute lull between crowds at their table, but that's the time to strike, come in and strike and just ask for some advice. And if you can make some friendships there between both uh, people in Artist Alley and also people like you attending Artist Alley and just seeing everything, uh, that's how communities start up and how, you know, artist circles start up. And you'll learn so much just from meeting these people in person once Vernon Area Public Library can actually throw this convention in person again. I love that advice, Jean. That's terrific. And yes, we hope to be in person this time next year. I'm going to ask you guys both a question about kind of just the current environment. So it seems I, I believe the coronavirus, coronavirus was addressed in Heart in the City. Um, and it was before I got on it. Oh, before you got on it. Okay. Yeah, I didn't address it at all. Wow. <laughs> well, I guess my question is, do you both, you know, both of you, do you see yourself 
kind of addressing that or other serious issues kind of taking place right now in your work? Or do you feel like, you know, no, you want to kind of, this should be kind of an escape from everything going on in the world. What are your thoughts about that? Um, so yeah, so Heart of the City did address COVID like right before I took over. Like his last arc was about them like having to wear masks and go to school. And then right before, at, right after that, it was like, you know, the kind of goodbye arc where he's going through like photographs or remember when he did that. And then I started and I didn't touch any of that um, because I don't like writing about current events. It's depressing. Um, and we have to deal with it enough. And there's also tens of thousands of artists out there that will do it for me. <laughs> you know, I don't feel like I have to be the one if I don't want to. It's kind of like having kids. A lot of people are having kids. I don't need to have them, you know? Um, but I also think about like writing current events, it gets to you, you know? Like there was a point when I was drawing archival quality and one of the main characters broke up with their significant other. And I, during that part where I was drawing it, I, I'm so like empathetic to the illustrations that I'm drawing because I, I want to mimic it as, po as well as possible so that I can draw it better. And I felt like I had gone through a breakup. And then I had to do that when I went back for inks and when I went back to color it, <laughs> you know? And so if I get, exhausted from a fake breakup I don't think I ever want to do any current event stories because I don't want to be steeped in that feeling especially if I don't have to be understood I can understand that relate to that okay yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to mention uh if any of you guys go out there and read archival uh quality uh it may sound like it's from what you just said, it avoids any type of emotional intensity or dark emotion. <laughs> it is a really dark book. Yeah, it is. It is super <laughs> intense and it will take you through a journey. It's just not current yeah, news. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, let me. I'm going to. Uh, situation working itself into your work in any way? Do you see the current oh, situation? Um, itself yes. I, 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 right now, I'm working on a book for. Uh, an announced book for DC Comics. So I'm taking a break from May uh, and it is set in the past. So I can't, and I'm not writing the book. Uh, I'm working with a very, very well-known writer who I can't say because it's not announced. So I'm, in that, I'm not. But uh, in principle, and also in my own work, let me, uh, I'm going to bring up a paraphrase of a quote from uh, Samuel Johnson, who's like half of Bartlett's quotes. Uh, and my paraphrase is, the job of art is to make the everyday magical and the magical every day. And it's a take the experiences you know and give you a different way to look at them and to give the experiences you've never experienced and make it feel like it's something that happened to you. So if you're doing something about a magical world, you need to make it somehow feel like it's connected to the life you already know and like it's a personal experience. And if you're going to write about something that happens in the real world all the time, you know, if you're going to do a comic book about dating or being bad at dating or something like that, you can't just do a literal transliteration of all the things your friends are going through. You have to figure out some way to put a little spin on it, mm. which makes people realize, don't just be trapped in your own worldview. Look at how there's a bigger world of other people out there and a different way of looking at your own life that you never understood before. Um, there's so many kids out there who think they are boring or worthless or their lives are of no interest to anybody who's not them and barely of interest to them. And then they read that novel or see the movie or read the comic book and suddenly they realize oh my life is pretty darn heroic i am an I, i'm awesome i'm like this character and i can actually make a difference in the world and people actually give it the, the people who matter to who should matter to me in my life i matter to them and that's really incredibly powerful and if you can so yeah, you don't have, you can write, you can write something set on an alien, like partially what I did, uh, partially set in Indiana where I grew up and partially set in an alien world. And I wanted to make Indiana look different to people who live there. And I wanted to make this fantasy world feel realistic and like someplace they could actually go to people who live in our world. We have a question and You just here have to transform. Watching. I'm wondering, this would be a good way to wrap up. Um, the person would like to know, um, looking back, what do you wish you had known about making professional comics when you were first starting out? 
What is something, a lesson you learned that you wish you had known about? Um, I wish I had known how much people are actually getting from comic books. <laughs> Knowing the going rates for a lot of things are very helpful. Um, whether you're just doing, you know, penciling or inking, but most importantly, a graphic novel. Um, like, to give you an idea, I got $3,000 for archival quality as an advance. Um, I do get royalties on it. Um, and my latest book, I got $40,000. So the latter is normal. <laughs> the former is a travesty. <laughs> so yeah, definitely wish I had known otherwise. I also, another thing um, I learned a bit later is that people expect you to negotiate a contract. You know, never get a contract and feel like you, you just have to keep it the way it is. Um, if you find something you don't like about it, bring it up. You know, it's a part of the contracting process is negotiation and anyone can negotiate whether they're a lawyer, or have a lawyer, or um, have an agent or not. If it's your contract and it's about you, you should be able to decide how you wanna go about it. Yeah, um, I'm gonna get away from, well, okay, let me just say really quickly on business stuff. If you're not good at business, have friends who are good at business and can read over the contract with you. Mm -hmm. uh, that helps a lot. Uh, getting away from the business stuff, I'm gonna say the thing I really wished I knew when I was breaking into the industry is that style is not all the things you put into a, into your style, into how you work, like in your drawings or your writing, stuff like that. It's the things you leave out. And that's what makes it really distinctive. And when you strip it back and say, this is unimportant, I'm not gonna mess with it because the things that are important about my art are these things and everything else I can toss out and it will actually make it work better. S style and effective storytelling comes from the things you leave out. You need to learn how to be able to do anything. Like if you hate drawing cars, but you're doing a, story set in a city, learn how to draw a car, but figure out how to do it in a simple <laughs> way that would match your style. You know, yeah. you have to learn how to do just about everything in a comic book, but you don't have to draw everything and every detail and you can figure out a way to kind of strip it down and make it cool. And that's part of the reason why uh, when I first saw Steens's uh, social media post on Encyclopedia Brown, I was like, <laughs> that is perfect. And then I was like, like going crazy on your comment for saying like, oh, this is so great. I love Encyclopedia <laughs> Brown. I've never seen it drawn so well before. So, you know, yeah. strip it down. Wonderful. Well, thank you both of you for joining us tonight and just sharing so many things. You give us so much to think about, so much good advice. It was really fascinating to hear about what you're working on. And, and it was just really a pleasure to, to host you. So thank you, Christine and Jean, for both joining us tonight. And Thanks for having us. Jean, do you want to say something? Can I start on one more thing? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, my website is just genehaw.com. There's a contact form on it. And mention, if you contact me through the contact form and mention VAPL or Vernonary Public Library, uh, I will do my best to answer any questions you have about art, comics, all that type of stuff. And please feel free. And I will try to give my best advice for any questions that didn't get answered here. Yeah, I, I offer the same thing at the last of my uh, panels. You can find me at ohaysteens.com or ohaysteens at gmail. That's O-H-E-Y steens. Um, find me. I love to talk about comics and to help people. So, yeah. Thank you. That is so generous of both of you. It was really greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks and, for attending everybody. Yeah, and you know what? We hope you join us for other mini Comic Con events taking place all week long. And be sure to check out our the calendar of the library's calendar to see what we have in store. So we hope to see you. Bye everyone. Bye.